Thank you very much, Marcus, and thank you everyone for joining us this morning. So Poland's graduation into developed market status is obviously a big day, but this uncharted territory doesn't come without risks. And here to discuss all of that and more is our esteemed panel of guests. So let me introduce them to you. Uh, the gentleman immediately next to my left is Bartosz Pawłowski, who is the Chief Investment Officer at MBank. Sitting next to him is Filip Paszke, who is the Managing, Editor, uh, Managing Director and Head of Brokerage at PKO. And we have also Pavel Shirovka, who is the Chief Executive Officer at PZU. And last but not least, Philip Lawler, who is the Managing Director of Global Markets Research at FTSE Russell. So Philip, I actually want to start with you. First, you know, it's a big day for Poland, graduation day into developed markets. But what does that actually say about the state of Polish markets today? Right, well, I thought it'd be just useful to just reappraise re the process and the journey traveled here. Uh, firstly, to make the point that uh, these reclassifications are quite rare. The last one FTSE did was nine years ago when we shifted Korea, South Korea, uh, from EM to developed. And it's just uh, to understand that this does take quite a long while. This conversion process takes quite a while. In 2008, uh, Poland was designated advanced emerging. 2011, it went onto the watch list in terms of the shift to developed. And it was only in 2017 that it was signed off in terms of hitting the criteria. So that took six years uh, for that process to work through. And just to, to very briefly outline the process that we undertake, we have a what we think is quite a transparent rules-based process. We have a country classification committee made up of market practitioners who weigh up the mechanics, the infrastructure, the plumbing of markets against 21 criteria broken into four broad criteria. Um, that of regulation, dealing, uh, custody, settlement, and also whether there's a functioning derivative and futures market. And it took six years on this watch list for Poland to meet all the criteria. The final one in terms of the custody uh, rules were met in 2016, and that's why in 2017 we made the announcement. So the important point for people to take away is this classification is very rules-based. It is all about, really, the mechanics of the market. Uh, what we don't do is the appraisal of the economy so much as all the, the market metrics and assessment of market metrics. This is about whether the Polish market operates as a developed market and what institutional investors would expect from a, a developed market. And of course, it does open, this shift does open the whole issue of acting as a catalyst of change, what we call the soft benchmarking issues, which we can discuss. But I thought it was just very useful at the outset to just outline uh, the FTSE Russell process for people. Well, thank you for that, Philip. And you know, since you mentioned the investor perspective, I want to bring in Bartosz to give us just that exactly. I mean, Philip was saying it's all about the plumbing of the Polish markets, but surely this has some implications for investor perceptions. How would they handle this transition from, you know, we've made a comparison from a small fish uh, in a big pond. It's really more like a minnow in a giant open ocean of developed markets. How do you think investors are going to perceive that? Yes, there's two issues to that, two, two questions. One, one is uh, the comparison that was made before to Israel and Korea, which aren't particularly successful <coughs> in terms of investors' activity. Those markets are different to Poland in many ways, but nonetheless, the historical evidence is not particularly uh, encouraging, if you will. Uh, second of all, uh, there is the concept of which companies, not just how much you are in an index, but also which companies uh, constitute you in the index. So in the emerging markets, there was a really long list of companies that would qualify for the EEM index. Now we have only a handful. So foreign investors, bigger investors now, who will now look into Poland, but they will be choosing just from, you know, Pavel is probably very happy because the weight of his company has gone up uh, and there will be more money coming his way in terms of stock exchange, but, uh, but there is a significant amount of mid and smaller sized companies that just dropped out of the index. And the risk, the biggest risk that I think the stock exchange and everybody needs to take into consideration that we're going to have a bifurcation. So you're going to have like a few big companies and the same happened in, in, in the previous instances like Israel or Korea which take the bulk of the foreign flow and there's the rest which is forgotten and the, the, I guess the issue here is to make sure that this doesn't happen it's very difficult but from the foreigners point of view we the, the investment uh, in terms of the amount of companies that they invest in has shrunk 
Pavel, since uh, Bart just referred to you, let me ask the question, are you happy about this change? What does this mean now for uh, companies such as yourselves, but also in general for, for smaller Polish companies who might not have the resources to immediately make the changes expected of a developed market? Yeah, I mean, obviously we are happy because uh, in a, you know, it's a win-win situation for us to a certain extent. Simply, we get attention of more investors. It's a broadening uh, the investors on which radar we, we are. Um, obviously, our active uh, investors, they have been already you know, looking at us very actively. And um, they're looking at us more as an insurance player comparing us to our peers globally. But obviously, the passive funds uh, are now coming our way. And we see that picking up, obviously. That's very good for the eight stocks that, for example, right now come become promoted to the six stocks 600 index. It is true <coughs> that probably it will be a little bit more challenging for um, for the mid and smaller companies of the Polish stock exchange to to compete for the passive funds mostly. But I think that it you know let's not forget um, that Poland right now is in some form of a mixed situation being ranked the developed market by the FTSE, but also still being an uh, emerging market on the MSCI screen, which means that uh, theoretically, we, we, you know, we just broadened the base of investors that are looking at Poland. And so you know, the hope is that the EM flows will still go into Polish directions, but the DM flows that, for example, are following the stock 600 index will have Poland on the radar. We'll look at what happens in Poland, but it's absolutely true. Those companies right now, they have a bigger stage. The question is, how are they going to perform on that stage? Are they able to uh, become global players? And here I believe that financial services is actually one of the interesting products that Poland can export itself. I think that the Polish financial sector, like PKOBP, like PKOSA, like PZU, uh, have been you know, very good at embracing new technologies and really innovating their way through the customer experience. And I believe that this is something that compares very favorably to the European average. And I believe that this is something that investors are looking at too, and particularly in the insurance space. I see that investors see in PZU something that they don't see in a lot of uh, companies, and uh, we attract people, and that's, uh, that's why I'm happy. It's good to know that you're happy. Now, I want to pose this question out to Philip Paskus, since Pavel mentioned a little bit about you know, Poland's edge in financial services, and you know, as a representative of the brokerage industry, what do you anticipate would be the benefits and maybe challenges as well for the, the industry now that Poland is making this transition? Sure. Um, gosh, it's so much hard. Uh, it's so hard to add some value after three such prominent speakers. <laughs> but um, yeah, the, I think this, um, uh, we, as a broker, as, as a bank, we're also happy. Uh, it, but this, this, this is a happiness of a gamer that, that made it to the next level. It's just so hard to, uh, to survive on this next level of the game. And by the way, gaming is a very uh, fast growing industry on the, on the Warsaw Stock Exchange. Um, uh, so, so the field will change uh, for us, uh, I would say, uh, because of the fact that we're both a part of emerging market space and developed market space, it will not change suddenly. Uh, but will, this will, there will be a gradual shift. And, and by the way, this shift has been going on for some time on the Warsaw Stock Exchange with increased, um, in, uh, an increased activity of international investors over the past few years, as you have seen on the graph, and also increased presence of the global uh, banks uh, as uh, remote members of the Warsaw Stock Exchange. So we've, we as local brokers, we've been in this game for some time right now. And, and so in, in that sense, nothing really changes for us. Um, I think the big question for the market uh, is, is the uh, access to the bigger pool of money, is that going to overcompensate for the much lower um, uh, weight of Poland in, 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 in the indices? And I think in the short term it will not. So short term we will see uh, a lot of uh, shift from the active uh, money management uh, that will have to sell uh, Poland. Uh, those, who are, uh, those who are covering emerging markets, they will have to sell Poland. And those active fund managers who are looking at developed market space, whom local brokers don't know yet because we haven't been servicing them for years. We've been you know, building a relationship with the emerging markets community. And these active fund managers, they will not buy uh, uh, Poland because of its scale. Uh, what will happen, uh, we, we might get access to, to some new, uh, um, uh, new, new pools of uh, assets coming from the passive investors. But these passive investors, they don't talk to local brokers. They don't take part in local IPOs. Um, so in that sense, um, uh, the situation will be m much more challenging for, uh, for local brokerage and for local banking industry. 
And how long do you say would this adjustment process take place over, would you say, in the next year? Are we talking the next few years? Yeah, I think it's the question, you know, it's a function of the, of the rate of development of, 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 uh, of capital market in Poland. I mean, if, if the companies are going to grow scale, if they're going to merge and they will become not only regional players, but also um, European players, I think this interest will come. Uh, so it's a much it's a much longer process, uh, and as I said, in the long term, I'm quite optimistic because you know Poland is not a small open economy uh, that's reached its potential. It's it's the you know fifth, sixth largest uh, country in the EU, and it's a lot of potential for the economy to grow and produce more uh, sizable uh, uh, companies that that you know that will jump on the radar screens of of developed market investors. It's just that we're not there yet in terms of size and liquidity. So in long term, I'm a positive, but uh, a couple of years to come. As I said, we, we will still have the best of both worlds, being both part of emerging and, and developed. And if MSCI one day uh, was to make a decision to upgrade us, that's a big game changer, and that's going to be you know, uh, even more bumpy ride. Bartosz, I saw you nodding vigorously when Philip was highlighting the, the challenges, which include, of course, name recognition and needing that sort of name recall among international investors. So you know, tell us then, what do you think would be Poland's selling point? We know the challenges. Philip has told us a little bit about them. What would be Poland's main selling point then to this bigger global audience? Well, I guess this time is different. I mean, it's not Israel, it's not South Korea. It's going to be a little bit different than that. But, but seriously, it's been, what's been said a few times here is that we have the best of both worlds, EM and DM. Uh, yes, to some extent, but, but we're also the smallest bit of both worlds. And again, the way you can sell yourself is you, can, you have to distinguish yourself from others. And uh, I think Pavel mentioned, and, and it's been mentioned before, that in, on the Polish stock exchange, this is dominated, especially the big caps, by, by the financials or insurance companies and some energy companies. Uh, whether they are state-owned or not, this is not something that investors have been piling into so far this year. And look at the European financials. They are just nobody wants to touch them with anything. Uh, and so you need to show to the world that your financials are different to the European financials, despite the fact that correlation is pretty high. Uh, so that's one. We uh, need to probably somehow get the tech thing going. It was mentioned here, the CD project, which is the Witcher, the company that made the Witcher, Witcher game. It's a, it's a hugely successful company. Uh, and this is something that's also in vogue these days, right? So we, I guess we need to gear more into the non-financial, the non-traditional uh, composition of the index. But at the same time, it will be extremely difficult. And kind of from the experience to convince active investors to actively look at the market, which is 0.1 of an index, it's, it's almost impossible. So passive investors have no choice. They will do that. But in order to attract some of those guys, you need to make sure that you see our financials is a completely different story to the Eurozone financials. This is true, by the way. The capitalization levels and stuff are, are much better. But somehow, I doubt that somebody in Chicago or LA or, or New York will necessarily very quickly look at it that way. So it's up to some of those guys to just travel and to explain to people that this is actually a correlated asset, but with a bit of a better quality and, and can outperform. But again, there are only a handful of companies that can afford the resources to, to spend on international relations and to travel and to explain, which, which is seriously going to be a massive challenge. Pavel, I can see you have a lot of opinions on this. So what do you think about those challenges that Bartosz highlighted? Well, I just wanted to say, you know, this is exactly what comes up when you ask an economist to do a selling pitch. It's just, they're too honest. It's, it doesn't work. So, um, no, I, I think, that, you know, the Polish story being told, I mean, for the time being, it was a very mature player, very you know, decent-sized player in the emerging market space. Right now, what we have to show is that it's a developed country which is having growth. And, and obviously, you know, for the story for the time being of the growth was obviously building on low cost labor, on technological shift, on, on you know, closing the gap to the Western countries. The question is, what is going to be the growth engine of Poland going forward? As I said, you know, how do we differentiate say, ourselves? Financials are, are, are one answer to the question. I think that, you know, Polish banks are attractive. They're currently, um, you know, in terms of ROE, they're probably their European peers, but uh, 
the banking sector has been extremely fragmented. We see a lot of consolidation going on. I think this will lead to a situation where the Polish banking space will be dominated by a couple of players whose, rental, you know, whose margins we go pick up. So I think you know, there's a real investment case to be done uh, for investors in the Polish banking space. I think insurance, to make some you know, uh, publicity, uh, is an interesting case. And I, and I think that this is something that differentiates us. In terms of size, PZU is you know, not in terms of market capitalization, not that big a player. I think we would rank by market cap around top 50 in the world. But we are one of the most profitable insurance companies in the world with, with an ROE of over 20%. And over time, we've been able to build a whole model around insurance products, banking products. We own two banks in Poland, asset management, health care. And we try to bundle this into a holistic services um, ecosystem that I think you know, is not only mirroring what, what is going on in the world, but is at the forefront of, something, of some of the events that are going on in our sector. And I think that this is something that catches people's attention. And I, you know, I can see that a lot of Polish companies are going exactly the same way, that until now they've been able to close uh, the, the gap to their Western peers. Uh, it's either state companies like PKO, like PZU being transformed into being run like private companies, or private comp uh, companies being funded and, and you know, fighting for the Polish market. <coughs> right now they have reached scale. Right now they have... Uh, also their own IP, and I think that they will go uh, with very much success uh, abroad, and, uh, and I think that this is something that we can, you know, let's sit down in, in two years' time and see where Poland is. I, 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 I would be rather betting on it. All right, what about you, Philip? What well, do you think I just thought I'd expand on that. I think this is uh, looking at this from a very macro perspective, a longer term, more strategic rather than short term tactical, and saying the big opportunity when you shift from EM to DM is you have the opportunity to shift the equity risk premium being attached mm. to you as a market. Uh, clearly in the EM complex, as we're seeing right now, enormous volatility going on in terms of the macro environment, the FX market volatility, and detaching yourself from that environment clearly gives you the opportunity to get the, the valuation shift, this shift in equity risk premium. It doesn't happen overnight but I think that is the really big opportunity set uh, that, that lies b before Poland. It is people genuinely seeing it in terms of market volatility as having developed market characteristics. As soon as that gap narrows, that is when you get the valuation differential shift. Well, we do have a couple of lessons in recent history with markets <clears throat> excuse me, certain markets being upgraded from emerging to develop. We have the example of Israel, which we mentioned earlier, and South Korea as well, which I believe Bartosz made mention of. So you know, just drawing on that experience and looking back on those countries' experiences, obviously two very vastly different markets from uh, Poland in a lot of ways, but what are the similarities? What are the lessons that we can draw from that? It is difficult to draw lots of similarities. I mean, Israel is a very particular tech-based industry, and obviously, clearly, we had a lot of, effectively, the transference to, to the NASDAQ going on technically. But really, it, Korea is an interesting case in point, going back to the divergence between FTSE and MSCI. We, we deemed uh, South Korea should be classified as developed back in 2009. Really, we thought, if you look at Korea, it's predominantly Samsung. Uh, that by most guises, and the functionally the market classified it as developed. MSCI still runs it as an EM. What we did see was very big institutional funds uh, managers such as Vanguard making that strategic switch on, on the back of that. Uh, so the fund flow dynamic can be quite substantial, um, but I think it goes back to the cultural, the soft, the intangible shifting from EM to developed market. It does shift over time the corporate culture, the, the regula regulatory culture, the governance culture, but more importantly, the investment culture, as I mentioned, in terms of that benchmarking of your what equity risk premium you should be attaching is, for me, the absolute key metric. Well, since you mentioned corporate culture, I do want to uh, bring this question back to Philip and Pavel, as well as our representatives of Polish industry. How has that transition been? I know 
Uh, Pavel, for instance, you probably, your company's probably made some of the changes necessary to prepare for this moment. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that process, and is that something that smaller companies will be able to replicate now that we're at this juncture? Yes. I, I, just to follow up on one, one thing that Philip said, I think that you know the, the, the example of, of, of South Korea is a good one because the one thing that Poland is still lacking compared, for example, to that market is truly global players. And I believe that this is the next step that Poland needs to take. I mean, maybe CD Projekt is, is, is one of those that we can highlight. But I think that you know Poland needs more brand names, more companies being globally be, uh, recognizable. And, and therefore, you know, I'm not that afraid of you know only a handful of companies uh, be profiting right now from the shift because this is exactly the, the direction it should be taken. There will be only a couple of companies who can actually make it to the league, and obviously, this is the companies that have the the strongest corporate culture. These are the companies that 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 also are able to differentiate themselves the strongest. PZU has uh, you know transformed itself over over a long time you know as a, we've been a state owned company uh, obviously you know the monopolistic only insurance company in Poland over the time 2010 IPO and really changed it into a normally stock exchange like privately run company and and uh, you know the, the the story of the last 2 years really to say was to say you know we don't want to be a, a local insurance company uh, obviously we are also present in the baltics we are present in ukraine but what we really want to do is to try to be a global financial player out of warsaw and uh, and this particularly for example in the asset ma management space i'm incredibly happy that we've been able to attract uh, Talent from overseas coming into Poland. You know, recently we've been able to hire our, our CIO from MetLife here in London. So, you know, it's it's really about the people, and and I think that it it all goes hand in hand. I think Warsaw has become a really interesting place to to be in. It's become a, a hub for for CE and for for continental Europe that attracts people, that brings people into the companies who who can attract them, and everything. You know, this all creates a dynamic. Polish companies will be able to, you know, go even further into international space. Philip, you mentioned the gaming industry as one of kind of the more promising industries. Do you see them being able to capitalize on this uh, new developed market status? And how exactly would you know smaller industries like that be able to do it? Well, they are already doing that. <coughs> that they're uh, you know very active in, in investor relations and um, you know going out meeting investors. Um, and ha having a global product helps a lot in, in, uh, in that. What I wanted to stress uh, you know, talk, when you talk about co corporate structure, uh, corporate culture, sorry, is um, I think there's a lot to be done for Polish corporates uh, to prepare for that, uh, for, for, for that increased exposure into international investors. And those who want uh, embrace that change, you know, they will be so, somewhat left out. And, you know, at, and a lot of Polish companies um, uh, have to work more on investor relations, have to be more active uh, the meeting investors, talking to investors. You know, even when you look at some websites, uh, in the, the might some, there might be some large caps in Poland, or let's say some medium caps in Poland that don't have English websites on the investor relations side. So, you know, there's a lot to be done on the corporate culture and on, the, and on reaching out to investors, especially that, um, that uh, as I said, we, 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 hopefully um, the, 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 these companies are, are, are going to be, you know, followed by, by inter international investors on increasingly. Bartosz, I want to bring you in here for the investor perspective again. I mean, investors want specificity. They want concrete steps being taken to show that Poland is ready for this change. What exactly do you think they want to see to be able to be convinced that, yes, Poland is going to be you know, a, a major player in, in the developed market space? Look, I, I generally think it's the little things that matter rather than the grand th you know, plans for the next five or ten years. It's uh, uh, things like the repo market. Like for, for the market to function properly, you need to be able to also short the market, to borrow properly, which is, which is something that we need to work on, right? Uh, let's not forget that many of the uh, ETF providers, they, they have the inventory of the, the, the paper and they rent it out or repo it out to, to, to the market to short. This is something that we need to, to, to step up with still. It's happening, it's getting in the right direction, but we're still probably not there. Uh, another thing is the reporting. It kind of always amazes me how a huge multinational U.S. companies can re report quarterly earnings a week after 
the quarter is over and it's 25th of uh, September and there are still some smaller companies in Poland that haven't reported the second quarter earnings. So there is, it is now again changing and, and I think what's, what's happening is that it's putting all those institutional uh, framework uh, into spotlight because of the FUSI decision and, and now people are going to look, okay, so we have this thing of Poland is now in the developed markets, let's have a look at it. And, and I need, first of all, of course, investment opportunities with good international players and growth and stuff like that, but I also need the little things, you know, the, the smoothness of the processes. And I think Matic here was before the, the, the chairman of the stock exchange, uh, I, I think he's very well aware of that. They're working on some initiatives, but uh, before we get to the point where PZU hopefully is recognized as the global insurance player and, 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 and actually invests abroad much more and, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's like a, a huge international house or, or PKO or any other company, we really need to work on the minutia because ultimately this is what matters for the global investors. And, and, and I, I know this may not sound sexy or exciting, but sadly, in, in the, these days in the world of finance, not many things are, and, and, and we really need to work from the bottom up rather than just look you know, 20, 10 years down the line. Phil Lawler, do you agree with Bartosz's point that it really is about the finer details? Well, yeah, look, I, I, th I think this is a journey that's got to be travelled, and I think this is a, a major catalyst of change that will need to change culture and, and all the way through in, in, at the company level, continuing the, the broadening that we, going back to our criteria, you know, short selling was one of the criteria we had, but clearly with there's more work to be done in terms of the mechanics. And so that's the broadening and the deepening of the, the exchange, but, but, but really it is at the corporate governance level that I think this, that we've got to see this over, over a period of time. There's, there's, it can't happen overnight. Uh, but where would do we think that will be in five years' time in terms of investor relations and, and things? It's, if you don't change gear, you're, you're under a very stark spotlight. Now, I want to focus now a little bit on you know, Poland's changing identity. Obviously, this foray into developed markets is an exciting change, but at the same time, it does still have the advantage of being a gateway of sorts into Eastern European markets. And, you know, is that something that companies in Poland would want to retain as kind of, um, or Poland as a market in general, really, as, as that sort of dual identity where it can play with the big boys in, in developed markets, but also retain a little bit of that sense of, you know, EM light, if you will, sort of um, identity where it, it, it is a bit of an entryway into that part of the, the region. What do you think, Bartosz? Well, so th that actually, so finally I can sound a bit more positive. Uh, that is something that I think the biggest is the biggest opportunity. So, you know, have a look at Spain, where, where, where the banks over there are considered to be a gateway to Latin America. I mean, these days it's not particularly fantastic market-wise, but, but generally speaking, if you want exposure to Latin America, you know, your, your BBVA or Santander are there. You can do that. And you have the regulatory environment, which is a state-of-the-art, world-class developed market with the exposure to potentially fast-growing countries. Again, not these days, but on occasion. Uh, and in this case, I, I, I think this is the best opportunity that we have to, to convince international investors that this is not only the, the again, state-of-the-art institutional framework, which is kind of EU, but, but also a gateway to some of the much smaller economies around where there are good companies in Czech Republic, there are a few good names that you can invest in. It's a tiny stock exchange. Even in Hungary, three names that you can invest in and so on. Who knows, maybe soon Ukraine and, and other countries like that. If we manage to convince people that getting exposure to uh, some of those energy companies, some of the financials or, or, or other companies in Poland is the way to, to have exposure both for Poland but also on the region, then we can win and capitalize on that. This is, this is something that I would focus on uh, rather than just wait and hope that somebody in, 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 in Boston or, or, or Chicago again uh, uh, spots a one nice company in Poland that he or she wants to invest in. Pavel, do you agree? Is that a good strategy or would you might as well go all or nothing on one side or the other? No, I, I think that's absolutely the direction. And, and as a matter of fact, we can see that, for example, PZU has already been used as something of a proxy for CE for some of our investors because it's one of the most liquid stocks in the market and, 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 and we see some correlation there. So I think that you know not only market-wise, we want to play that card. And when I said that PZU wants to expand 
Uh, we mostly, you know, we don't think about going into Germany tomorrow, but we, we mostly think about our own, uh, our own backyard, which is, which is uh, Central Eastern Europe. We're already present in the Baltics and Ukraine. We, I think we will want to go even further down that road. Why? Because a lot of the countries uh, that we just mentioned, they have had a similar growth summary, a similar path like Poland, and that means that some of the solutions that we've been able to build up in Poland are scalable and can be expanded to those countries. If we're thinking about, you know, wealth creation and you know the answer that you know, asset management and investment needs to help them. Healthcare, I think, is an incredibly uh, strong topic all over the region where people simply, with the demographics and with wealth creation, want to invest more into their health. This is one of the the, the growth areas that we want to invest very heavily in, in Poland. But I believe that it, you know, this story doesn't end with Poland. I think healthcare will be important over CE. And I think that if we are able to position ourselves in front of our investors as one of the dominant players in that space in CE, that is something that will really you know, make us recognizable also from Boston and Chicago. Philip, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, just um, you know, one other sector I just wanted to add. When you look at the retail space, for example, there are a couple of retail players that are expanding into Central and Eastern Europe, and they are already seen as a place on uh, CE consumer. And there's, you know, there's, there's no other stocks listed in Czech Republic or Hungary that, that you can get that, that exposure. I'm talking about LPP or, or CCC. So that these are well-known names in the, in, 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 in the retail space, and they got it right. And by the way, they, they were far more successful expanding into Central and Eastern Europe than expanding in the West, which also they are trying to do, but with much less success, which, which, which means that you know, Polish companies, they uh, understand Central European context much better. Uh, and, 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 and can be used as a gateway to, 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 to CE markets. Hmm. Okay. Well, since uh, Bartosz keeps mentioning his fund managers in Boston and Chicago, I do want to ask all of you to kind of, you know, if you were to make a pitch right now, right, like to, how would you sell Poland to uh, uh, an investor like that? If they say, I, I want to buy something in Poland, I don't know what, or I want to do something and invest in it, I don't know how to do it. What would you say to, to somebody like that, Bartosz? Uh, I guess just like an elevator pitch is that it's cheap. <laughs> like seriously, no, cheap for a reason, but it is cheap. Uh, we we're currently somehow getting hit on the one hand from the, you know, fallout from the European financials underperformance, to put it mildly, uh, which which also impacts the stock exchange. There is still some uh, uh, anxiety about the state ownership of the companies, which I'm not sharing. To be honest, but but it is something that people are noticing uh, as as a potential impediment, uh, and and other things relating the the market structure. But uh, this is reflected in the price. Some of those companies that were mentioned here and others that weren't uh, are are perfectly capable to be compared with uh, with some of their Western peers, and they are you know half the valuation. Which you know if this was some far you know frontier market, that would make sense in case of a country which is part of the EU and part of this institutional system, not necessarily so. So uh, look, I, I don't know what's going to happen in the next five to 10 years, but what, what I do know is that this is one of the cheapest markets out there, also on the large caps, and if that doesn't get you interested, then I don't think anything else I can say will. <laughs> yeah, just just adding a few metrics to yeah, that, um, and you know, Poland, according to our estimates, Poland is trading at 10.8 p, which is at a big discount to both developed market, but also to historical average where Poland has been trading, uh, long-term average is around 12. So it's um, uh, it's you know, it, it trades at a big discount both to developed and its historical average. It's got a free cash flow generation that is improving. Uh, we're looking at 8% uh, free cash flow uh, and EPS growth this year. Uh, the dividend yield are, you know, are turning around and, and are, are, you know, are going up from the rock bottom in 2018. So, and um, especially in the financial sector, which is which has large companies, liquid and investable companies. Yeah. Pavel, I know you have a lot of opinions on valuation. What do you think? Is cheap really? A well, selling point. That all goes down to my point of economists making elevator pitch. The word is attractive. It's not. <laughs> no, but it's absolutely true. I mean, valuations, as we said, um, you know, forward-looking PE, I think, uh, when we look at, you know, FTSE uh, EM versus DM, I think there's some 20% yeah. uh, to, be, to be taken. So I believe that in this space, uh, absolutely true. Uh, when we look, for example, in how we are evaluated uh, compared to our peers, in terms of PE, 
uh, we are probably at par with them, but still uh, we uh, have a much, much higher profitability, probably double what, what, what our European or American peers are, are having, and that a much different situation in the market and a completely different growth pattern. So I believe that you know, our, our potential is pretty much in that space. But when it comes down to pitching Poland, I would say it is a, on the one side, emerging market which has uh, relatively political stability. And by political stability, I mean it doesn't have the structural underlying problems that, for example, the BRIC countries might have, uh, whilst being a developed country which still has the growth. And I think this is how it can differentiate itself. I think it is a, uh, you know, as we said, a good growth pattern with a very, you know, pretty much unprecedented, uninterrupted growth pattern that has been going on, which is still attractively valuated. And I think that you know, it has a very good so human cheap. capital. And by human capital, I don't only mean you know, the young, educated people in Warsaw and Krakow, but I also mean the human capital of Poles everywhere, like, for example, hubs in London. And I think this is pools of incredibly uh, talented, well-educated people that are you know, thinking about going back to Poland now and then. And I think this is an incredibly potential that, uh, that Poland still you know, really needs to tap into uh, strongly. I think that the last catalyst that I would add to, to Polish valuations is liquidity, which has been something of a problem over the last, I would say, two years on the Polish stock exchange. Here, I believe the fact that next year, uh, there will be a new pension reform kicking in, which should, you know, really enhance, um, you know, which will be a semi-obligatory uh, um, um, benefit system on, on through through the employees, where people will be get unrolled into into savings, a little bit like the Nest system in in, in, in the UK, and I, I believe this is really going to add for flows from the local investors as well. As we've seen local investors has you know have. Uh, lose, lost a little bit their share in, in overall flows in the stock exchange. I think this will come up nicely. And I think that with liquidity coming up, with all those flows from the pension funds going into the Polish market, I think this is where the valuations are really going to move the needle as well. This will also mitigate the risk of, um, of you know, bifurcation that uh, Bart just mentioned between large caps and, and small caps. So this, this is a very important element of, 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 that, of, of that program. Yeah. So Bartosz, I want to pose this question to you then. The, the, the selling point, the, the case for Poland as an investment venue, you know, uh, uh, Pavel mentioned a little bit of the political situation, which is relatively stable, as he said, and then you know there are these longer term demographic factors that give Poland a lot of potential, but you know, for an investor would say, I don't know, a decade long time frame, is that enough? Is that enough for them to be able to say, yeah, I would park my money here for the longer term? It's enough to consider it as an investment, right? I mean, you need to have long-term stability to... But not to actually even... invest in? Well, some of the people will have to, but uh, again, you, you really... We're competing in a world where the amount of money available in the system is anyway shrinking to some extent with the ECB withdrawing liquidity soon, the Fed doing that, and, and so on. So there is a shrinking pool of assets, uh, not dramatically so, but nonetheless, that we need to compete for. So those things that Pavel and the guys mentioned are certainly important... To, to tick the boxes to be an investable proposition. Then there is the cheapness, also known as attractive valuation. <laughs> uh, and, and that's that. And then it's it's down to whether we get people excited. And and I, I'm, I'm not going to lie, that will require the broad EM spectrum to turn a little bit because, as we noticed, the MSCI still has Poland as emerging market, and it's not particularly awesome these days for emerging markets in equity space, or in fixed income for that matter. So we will need to also kind of some global environment, which is a little bit better, so that people get more comfortable into doing something that they're not used to doing. And Poland is certainly, for many people, as of today, a new proposition to, to invest in. Valuable, potentially very attractive, but we need a few kind of you know, global events also to, to come together so that people are more uh, uh, less risk averse, if you will. Uh, so, so yeah, but, but again, you know, the 10 year, five year down the road spectrum is just something that this country is still going to be here and it's not going to do some crazy stuff. Uh, but at the same time, it's the small steps that really matter for the international investors.
And Philip Lawler, from you know, from an index perspective, I mean, all these uh, uh, attributes of Poland at the moment. Do you foresee kind of a bit of a sea change that that Fitzy Russell might have started in terms of Poland's graduation into developed markets? Do you foresee more indexes kind of making the same move as you as Fitzy Russell has in? Well, I, I, I'm not here to speak on behalf of MSCI, but we saw stocks <laughs> shift uh, last week as well. Um, as we said, MSCI do have a, a different process. We, we think it is less transparent. Uh, you can see all of the rules that we use for our criteria on our website. We try to make it as transparent and visible as possible. Um, and within the EM space, as I said, uh, there's a big divergence in terms of the treatment of South Korea that's gone on for nine years. Um, so. Uh, I, I can't speak for MSCI when they, they're going to make their, their, speak, their, their switch, if they do, but all we know is uh, this shift in perception that you, the, the type of move we've done does, does trickle through, and it goes back to the conversation and the, the opportunity set is it's the different audience that you uh, have access to by being defined as a developed market as opposed to EM. It, it sounds small, but it's actually over the long run very significant. You're dealing with a totally different cohort of investors. Pablo, do you agree? Is it a small thing now that's likely to uh, generate more positive impacts further down the road? Yes, absolutely. It's, it's like Walter said. I mean, at the end of the day, investors look at stocks, they look at the market, but at the end of the day, you know, investing is an art, it's not in science. You need the D click to, you know, convince somebody to say, okay, I'm going in. And then maybe this is exactly the kind of uh, you know, catalyst that investors were want, you know, waiting for to say, okay, they, you know, they, they're, on a good, they're, they're having a good pass. And uh, I think that elements like, for example, the pension reform and, uh, and the fact that you know, the Polish uh, government right now seems to, to do things uh, right in terms of you know, betting on the innovation, betting on, on, on getting up the value chain, what we've heard from the Prime Minister before. I think that all can add up nicely and at that point, you know, add up to, a, to an algorithm where somebody says, okay, I'm going to buy into it. Great. Well, thank you very much. I think that's all the time we had. So thank you very much to our panelists and thank you very much for our audience for being a wonderful uh, audience today. So I'll hand it back over to my colleague, Marcus.